Okay, so um, it is 12.01, so we would like to get started for our webinar today. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Kenya Lambert. I am the Vice President of Development at the Shriver Center on Poverty Law, um, and I am your moderator today. Uh, we hope everyone is well and uh, that you're taking care of yourself and also your family uh, during this um, very unique time in our country right now. Um, also, thank you for adjusting to the web-based format. Uh, our Lunch and Learn was scheduled to be in person, but as we all know, uh, we had to switch and we appreciate your ability to be flexible. Uh, just a few housekeeping rules at the moment. Uh, we are recording uh, this webinar, and also we are asking you to submit your questions. Uh, we will have the panelists speak first, and uh, we will proceed to have uh, an open Q&A. Uh, where in which you can either type in your questions in the chat box that's at the lower bar of your computer. Um, also, you can feel free just to type in your name to say, you know, I would like to ask a question and speak and unmute. And so we will welcome that format as well. We also realize that individuals may be calling in as opposed to um, uh, join in, joining us via video. So we would also like to open up the, uh, the phones as well for individuals to ask questions. Um, so let's begin. Um, many of us, we, we know that we are really in unprecedented times right now with uh, COVID-19 pandemic um, just at the center of our world. Uh, it is on our uh, really hearts and minds. Um, every day, all day. And so this webinar surely is very timely um, as uh, we talk about the work of the Shriver Center and our response uh, to this pandemic. So our response, what have we done uh, to date? Uh, the Shriver Center has had to pivot our advocacy uh, very quickly. Um, uh, on our website, we have our advocacy agenda for the year, but we all know that Springfield is closed. And so therefore, uh, we had to change to a new agenda. Yesterday, you may have received an email from the Shriver Center with recommendations for both uh, the local, state, and federal measures uh, to protect and support communities uh, experiencing financial hardship right now. Um, COVID-19 um, is showcasing and illustrating at the highest level uh, the impact of income inequality in this nation. And those who are um, struggling financially and experiencing poverty um, are experiencing this the worst. And so today uh, we have um, uh, my colleague, Stephanie Altman, uh, who will talk about um, uh, the insurance industry and what can we do in Illinois to cover the remaining uninsured. Stephanie is our uh, Director of Health Care Justice at the Shriver Center and also our Senior Director of Policy. Uh, also, we have joining us uh, today uh, special guest Dr. Cynthia Rogers. Uh, she is the President-elect for Physicians for a National Health Program. And Susan will talk to us today about health disparities um, and also the insurance landscape and what is Medicare for all and why is it such a hot topic uh, even now during the COVID-19 um, uh, situation right now. So I would like to welcome uh, my colleague, uh, Stephanie Altman, uh, to talk about our recommendations recently to the governor. And before we proceed, once again, just remember to enter your questions into the chat box at the uh, lower bar on your screen, and we will open up Q&A after the panelists uh, have spoken uh, today. Thank you. Stephanie, take it away. Thank you, Kenya. Um, again, thank you all for joining us. Um, we had originally uh, planned to talk about our proactive agenda to cover the remaining uninsured. And I am gonna to touch on that as well. But first I'm gonna talk about what is more of an immediate concern for all of us, as Kenya mentioned, what advocacy we can do on the state, local, and federal fronts to combat COVID-19, and especially to help our most vulnerable communities. So what can we do right now? The first thing that the Shriver Center did is send a letter of recommendations to the governor 
um, to expand Medicaid to cover the uninsured, the remaining uninsured, and to expedite Medicaid processing. This is This is very important so that we can feel comfortable um, and our clients can feel comfortable accessing healthcare. One of the problems that uh, we see most often is uninsured clients, often that's immigrant communities and other communities, or people who are waiting for Medicaid coverage due to historic backlogs in applications who feel that they can't seek medical care. And this isn't just for COVID and for testing and treatment, um, this is for all kinds of medical care, including mental health issues that we certainly expect to um, increase in this current uh, climate and for any kind of preventative care and other kinds of treat treatment that people need. So we sent this list of recommendations to the governor. Um, we are also sending a list of recommendations on a wider set of issues, many of which also um, impact the social determinants of health, like housing and income and other support. And we're looking at things in a very holistic manner. So in addition to the letter to the governor, which we will uh, send to you at the end of this presentation or link for you, we are also communicating with local governments and with our federal partners to try to see what can be done on the local and federal level. The governor and the Medicaid agency have announced as of Friday, and there's new information coming out each day, that they are working to cover COVID testing and treatment regardless of insurance status for low-income individuals as well as immigrants and undocumented individuals. The state put out a provider notice um, a couple of days ago that makes it clear to providers um, that they can cover these populations and reads in relevant part that all providers should immediately begin providing services in terms of COVID-19 related testing and treatment for the uninsured as well as Medicaid members. This was one of our number one recommendations and we're very um, pleased to see that the um, state is immediately responding with that. We continue to work on additional recommendations um, and speak with the governor's office and the Medicaid agency to see where we can help by bringing national experts or our expertise to them. Just this morning, we spoke with the Medicaid agency who is drafting permission for the federal government to get them permission to open up Medicaid funding even further and they are planning on submitting a series of different requests. Um, they all have technical names, 1115 waiver, 1135 waiver. I can explain some of them to you in our question and answer, but suffice it to say, they're all seeking the permission and the ability for the state of Illinois to receive federal funding, um, which some states have already done and to receive more federal financing to cover COVID testing and treatment and actually coverage on some other ancillary um, issues. They are going to post those soon, so we will have those links for you soon, um, but they are working on what our recommendations have recommended that they do. The federal government has also, through the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services that runs the Medicaid program, put out a series of guidance in the last few days, and Congress is supposed to act on legislation today or at the end of this week, by the end of this week, to allow states to harness a lot more money under the federal uh, Medicaid Act to cover these, um, these services. Uh, next slide, please. So this is all in the context of what was already going on in the state and is continuing. Governor Pritzker ran on a campaign to cover um, all Illinoisans, regardless of uninsured status, immigration status, um, and to have some path to coverage for everyone, um, including people who are undocumented. Next slide, please. So the, the major avenue, which is still very relevant in what's happening right now, is um, to create a Medicaid buy-in. And it's possible that all these emergency 
options that we are putting forward right now to cover testing and treatment for the uninsured and to cover more people regardless of immigration status with federal approval may grow to include what we um, proactively want, which is full coverage for everybody. The, the avenues that we were going down have not stopped. And in fact, what is happening right now on an emergency level is some of the first steps to that. So it's not as if we're really working on two different paths. Um, on a national call that we were on this morning, that is one of the things that states are looking at as this goes forward, as we get small parts of the population, or sorry, some treatments covered by parts of the population, and we move into the fall, especially if um, Congress and the presidency uh, were to change hands, but also just even in the current climate, we may see actually more opportunity for us to do what we were trying to do in the first place, which is use a state option, um, which is typically referred to as a Medicaid buy-in, to allow people to purchase Medicaid um, at subsidized levels or to cover low-income people at no cost, even if they don't fit into what would have been the traditional Medicaid type. So states are used many different names for this. There's names like public option, Medicaid buy-in, but the core features of all of these is to provide affordable options to individuals and families um, by either using healthcare.gov and a state version of that, or by using our current Medicaid program, which is what our governor is looking at doing, and being able to allow people to buy into that coverage. Next slide, please. So the potential goals for a Medicaid buy-in here are just as relevant um, as they were a week ago. Um, we want this to be a road to coverage for everybody, um, which Dr. Rogers will talk about. Um, we want to see what we can do right now, and these steps have to lead to full coverage. Um, and so we want to lower consumer costs. We want to cover in undocumented adults, and we are going forward with that as well as combating the threat from the Trump administration, um, you know, which is right now fighting to repeal the entire Affordable Care Act while at the same time they are putting out the Affordable Care Act option as how states can cover at 100% federal money treatment and testing for COVID-19. So um, I'm hoping that this um, dichotomy <laughs> will will bring a change at the federal and state level, um, certainly around trying to get rid of the affordable, which is the option that they are acknowledging they have to use right now just to do what we need to do. Next slide, please. So here are some resources for you. We will definitely be following up with more resources because new things are coming out every day. Um, the first is the um, Healthy Illinois Bill that we have been working on to cover the remaining uninsured, including in particular immigrants and undocumented people and people who are documented. Um, we continue to try to do that just because the legislature is on, um, you know, can't meet at this point. We are still talking to legislators, especially about what we can do to cover the older adults who fit into this uh, circumstance and are the most vulnerable, as we know, under um, at, of getting infected um, with COVID-19. We have our Shriver Center 2020 policy agenda, which covers um, many different things that contribute to the social determinants of health, as I mentioned, like housing and income and um, immigration supports. Um, and all of that is needed for people who um, are so vulnerable in terms of COVID-19 or their health uh, coverage in general. And so that policy agenda is not irrelevant. We're still going forward with that. And then the third is our Shriver Center recommendations um, to Governor Pritzker to combat COVID-19. And we will be continuing, as I mentioned, to um, work with the state and to advocate with the federal and local authorities to combat COVID-19 and to protect and preserve coverage as well as other services for our community. Thank you. All right, thank you, Stephanie, um, uh, for that wonderful explanation of what uh, the Shriver Center is doing, how we're responding, and how others can help. Um, as mentioned, 
there is an opportunity to ask questions at the end of um, the time for the panelists to speak. So if you can, uh, in the chat box, the Zoom group chat box, uh, please feel free to send uh, questions um, so that we can have a very lively discussion because um, there is so much going on right now um, and all of us are, you know, to be honest, quite on the edge, right? But um, we're here. Shriver Center is strong. Uh, many of you on this call have um, continued to support the work of the Shriver Center. And so this is what brings us comfort. And also what brings me comfort is the work that our attorneys are doing to address these key issues uh, with communities in need and communities experiencing poverty. Uh, so thank you, Stephanie, and to our uh, advocacy team. Now I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Susan Rogers. Uh, she is the president-elect of Physicians for a National Health Program. Uh, Susan will talk to us today about um, health disparities and also why is Medicare for all, um, what is Medicare for all and why is it needed? Uh, Susan, take it away. Uh, thank you so much, Stephanie. I mean, Kenya, for asking me to, to be involved with this. I'm always happy to talk about Medicare for all and I think especially during these times, it is so important. Uh, next slide. Um, one of the things that is really the big issue here in this country is the, the way medical care is financed, the way it gets paid for, it has made poor patients the ones that no one wants to treat. If you look at the reimbursements for Medicaid and Medicare, they're ridiculously low so that it doesn't even cover the cost to treat poor people. And so that's, this is a problem we have to change. Next slide. Um, I just wanted to point out about poverty because one of the things in this country is that if we look at concentrated poverty, that is more of an, it has more of a different, different uh, detrimental effect on black people and people of color than it does whites. And I have, we have to acknowledge that white poverty is very different from black poverty. White people often do not live in concentrated poverty areas like black people do. And you can see here, this is a, a national number. 25% of poor black people live in a concentrated poverty area. That is where more than 40% of people live below the federal poverty level. And we all know the federal poverty level does not give you anything extra. In fact, you're always at a deficit. It was never designed at a level to where people can live indefinitely. So that people who live in concentrated poverty have few access to a lot of things that communities provide, like schools, uh, grocery stores, doctors, parks, a safe area, so that pe Black people who live in concentrated poverty are much more of a disadvantage. Next slide. And so I want to point out what we spend a lot of money on health care. And if you look at the United States at the bottom line, we are at the uh, we spend more than anybody. Now that blue area in that line is what we already spend in uh, public dollars. And by public dollars, I mean, this is the government that pays for not just Medicaid, not just for Medicare, not for just the VA but it also pays the premiums for everyone who works for the government. So as a Cook County physician, the government paid my premium minus what I had to pay uh, that came out of my check, but it pay covers the premiums of everyone who works for the government, teachers, firemen, policemen, all of these people, it's already paying for their health care. And on top of that, we are also expected to pay part of our deductible. We have co-pays, we have, uh, money for drugs. So that's an additional almost $4,000 per person that gets spent. So we're already spending more than every other country um, in the world. And we don't get the best of care for all of this money. Next slide. Um, and despite spending all this money, we still have people who are uninsured. Now, back in the mid-60s, when Medicare and Medicaid came about, there was a drop, but it never dropped to zero. There has never been a goal to cover everyone in this country for health care. And as time went on, 
the Medicaid numbers increased after the Affordable Care Act, but they are now going back up. And keep in mind, like I mentioned before, Medicaid, it pays so low that many physicians will not even see patients who have Medicaid. Next slide. And if you look at who is uninsured by race, it's disproportionately affects people of color. Um, so that we are further disenfranchised from by being uninsured. Next slide. And there's the concept too of what we call underinsurance. And this is where you have insurance, but it really doesn't cover all of your needs and you end up coming out of pocket so much that you can't afford it. Um, one of the things that has really been a big problem are these high deductible plans. And keep in mind that if someone is working, they have uh, a premium cost taken out of their check every month. And then in addition to that, they may have a high deductible, sometimes five, $6,000, of which they have to pay before the insurance company ever pays a dime to cover their health care other than preventive services. So people are underinsured. They can't, studies show that if people have a $400 unexpected bill, they can't afford that. Yet you have people here who are expected to pay up to five, $6,000 before their insurance kicks in. And I like to liken this to almost like having your dream car. Let's say you have that Porsche in the garage and you take pictures of yourself and post it on Facebook. You've got this great car, but you don't have the keys to the car. And it's just like you have this insurance card. You have this card, but you can't avail yourself of the benefits because you can't cover the out-of-pocket expenses so that it can take effect. Next slide. And we spend all this money, like I mentioned, and yet we still don't live as long. We are one of the worst of industrialized countries in terms of our life expectancy um, compared to these others. Next slide. And the inequities are just, these are just a few that I chose to put here, but the inequities are almost in every area. As black people, we live shorter, three, at least three years shorter. And if you look at the geographics in this country, it's more of a deficit um, in the South. If you look at cities, it varies by zip codes. We often say that the zip code is a better predictor of good health. Uh, than anything else. Our infant mortality is twice that of white babies. And even our maternal, maternal mortality is three times that of white maternal mortality. And there's a lot of uh, reasons why that might be, uh, one of which is access to healthcare. And the lack of the Medicaid expansion, when the Affordable Care Act was developed, it was planned that all states would uh, take on the Medicaid expansion, which would be almost totally funded by the federal government. However, there are still 14 states that have not taken on the Medicaid expansion, uh, mostly in the Deep South. And that has left, knowing that the majority of peop Black people live in the South, that it's left about a quarter of Blacks in this country uninsured. Next slide. So, if you do have insurance, keep in mind, people keep talking about a lot of choice. And actually with health insurance, private health insurance, you don't really have much choice. You really don't have a choice of even the plan because that's determined by your uh, employer. And then that plan will have networks of doctors and hospitals. And keep in mind, these networks are made to restrict your access to care. You can't go to the doctor you want. You can't go to the hospital you want. You have to go to the uh, doctor and, net and hospital that are in your network. The drugs that may be covered will uh, vary and a lot of insurance companies will tier drugs and that is where they have some drugs that you have to pay extra if you want that to be on the formulary. And of course, those are high priced drugs and it keeps people out of their network. So this is one of the ways they keep patients who have pre-existing conditions or what we call a high cost uh, patient out of their insurance network. Um, you pay more if you do go out of network and you end up with surprise billing. And sometimes this is totally out of your control. If you go to an emergency room, let's say you've got abdominal pain, it turns out that you've got appendicitis. Well, the ER doctor that saw you in the emergency room may not be in network. 
the surgeon who's on call, who has to take out your appendix that night, may not be in your network. So all of you think you're doing the right thing by going to the hospital that you're in network in, but you still may end up with surprise bills. And then you never know exactly what is covered. So even though you think your appendectomy may be covered, there may be things done that were not part of that coverage. And so it's difficult to determine what your plan offers or what services are provided. How many people know that if they break their leg, how many rehab sessions they would be covered for with their current insurance? You really have no way of finding that out. It's very difficult. It's hidden information. And so you're stuck with a plan and you don't even really know what's in your plan. And you think you have good insurance, but most people who think their insurance is good either have the financial resources to cover their out-of-pocket expenses or they've never had to use it. And keep in mind that half of those who are employed, you know, you can change the, your employer may change your insurance plan um, so that it's not anything stable. Even if you choose to keep it, you don't know what's going to happen next year. And, you know, we have to remember that employee, employment is actually a very fragile relationship. And I'll get to some data in a minute. But you don't know how really how long you are going to be employed for a variety of reasons. So the, this whole concept, I want to keep my private health plan, you're not in control of that. You may want to keep it, you may be able to keep it for a year, but you don't know. Next slide. Now, there's a, where is all this money going to that we spend? Uh, a lot goes to drug companies, and you can see that they make so much more in profit than uh, the rest of the Fortune 500, there is no way that we can control those costs. And if you look at it too, it's just a, it's just sort of an uh, immoral, um, uh, an, an immoral system that drug companies have, where they they take they take advantage of people who need them, and then then it costs more. Um, and then they often complain about they need uh, money for research and development. But the NIH pays for most of that. We are already paying for the to the government for a lot of this research. And companies often, they make 10 times more than what they do end up putting into research and profits. And that's because they can just decide on the cost. There's no way to control costs at this point. Next slide. Now, if we had uh, negotiated prices, we could have saved, we could save money. Uh, the VA was able to do that. And if Medicare had been able to do that, we would have saved a lot of money uh, by paying the VA prices for those drugs. So we're not able to do that. And keep in mind that who decides the price of milk? It's not the grocery store, it's the government. So the government dictating prices isn't a foreign concept. I mean, this is something that we should do. Next slide. Um, and as I mentioned before, the, uh, your relationship with your job is really a fragile relationship and millions lose their in private insurance every year for a variety of reasons. Um, like I mentioned, firms switch their coverage, people quit their job or they get fired, the company no longer exists. There's a lot of reasons for that, but to tie healthcare to your job really is not a practical way to do that, nor does it ensure lifelong coverage. Next slide. And we spend a tremendous amount of money on bureaucracy. Um, hospitals spend about 25% of their income on bureaucracy. And I think if you look at this number, that there are almost twice as many billing clerks as there are hospital beds, which also means there's twice as many billing clerks as there are nurses. That's, I think, a phenomenal statistic. And keep in mind, this billing clerk is not providing any care at all. The nurse is, but there's fewer of those. So there's a lot of money spent on bureaucracy that is not providing any care. It's just the way the system is, is set up. And it's, that's what a profit-based, uh, profit-motivated system does. Next slide. 
Single payer, however, in Medicare for All, because there would be only one payer, and keep in mind, Medicare for All is a federally funded but privately delivered system. It is not socialist at all. The VA care is by definition socialist. It's a federally uh, funded program that is delivered in federally funded buildings, delivered by uh, federally employed uh, providers. So that is by definition a socialist system. Single payer would not be. It would be the same doctors who are out there now, the same hospitals that are out there now who would be providing the care, and we would have com comprehensive coverage for all medically necessary services, and we would even expand that so that we would expand to include dental, we would expand to include uh, physician coverage, I mean uh, mental health services, so that the, the increase in care would be there for everything that would be uh, medically necessary. And there would be no need for private insurance. There are private insurances in other European countries with single payer systems, but those insurance companies are highly regulated and they offer the same care and the same benefits. Um, and that's part of the problems in some countries where people can, uh, front their way to the head of the line. But here, there would be no private insurance and everyone would be entitled to the exact same benefits. Next slide. And we can pay for this. It makes economic sense. I'm not an economist, but most economists will say that the savings from this uh, elimination of the bureaucracy of all these middlemen, the insurance company profits, the pharmaceutical company profits, we can pay for covering everyone. And that the time, this is now the time for Medicare for, okay. Medicare for all. Okay. Next slide. And I want to mention something about the public option because the problem with the public option is that it's still based on private insurance. You still do not eliminate the uh, any of the bureaucracy, any of the uh, time spent on billing and administration that comes with having multiple payers. Um, you have private insurance companies that everybody has different benefits, different coverages. So it's just a very fragmented difficult landscape to maneuver and to navigate through. And the way that they cut costs is to cut benefits. And that's something that we can't allow to happen. And that's what has happened now is that the Affordable Care Act has been um, chipped away. It doesn't have the same mandatory benefits as before. So the public option would not eliminate any of the high cost problems that we have currently because it would still be based on private insurance. Next slide. And I just want to mention about COVID. Uh, a pandemic like this or any natural disaster really highlights the reason why everyone needs access to health care. Um, everyone benefits from the testing and the treatment because you don't, you want everybody to be treated because then it does not spread. The health of, the health of society is really only as good as the the health of the people who are in it. So it is to our benefit to have everybody covered, everybody treated for this. Um, it would be a national program, so it wouldn't be this piecemeal address to healthcare that states are having to do because our national government hasn't taken the lead at this. And then also what happens after the pandemic is over and the people who have health needs that current that will still exist because they were infected, who was going to pay for that. They will not be able, many will not be able to return to work, so they will not have their employment insurance. So the whole idea that everyone benefits because when everyone is healthy, I think we all have to wrap our arms around. Because when you go to a restaurant, you want the person who's cooking your food to be healthy. When you get in an Uber, you want the driver of that car to be healthy. So it is to our benefit that everyone is healthy. And Medicare for all, which is a cheaper way to do it, everyone has the same benefits, everybody is entitled we can address this need and this is what will work. Next slide, I think that's the end. Oh, this is my last slide. This is why we have a problem. This is, and this has not changed. This is an old slide and it's, 
uh, it's still in the problem here is that the lobbyists and the insurance company and all, they are just uh, blinding Congress with money. And this is why we can't get anything passed. Next slide. And these are just some websites that I find very useful in trying to get information uh, about issues. And the CDC has a good website um, on COVID, so you can get updated information on that. But uh, take a picture of this slide if you want, because this is a very good resource, I think, uh, to access further information. And that's my last slide there. All right, thank you, Susan. Um, that uh, was very insightful. Um, um, Susan is a, a longtime friend of the Shriver Center, and um, I saw her uh, this past summer uh, give a lecture uh, to over 50 uh, medical students about, um, about health disparities, right? And so it's really important to have the next generation of physicians understand uh, these issues and also uh, understand Medicare for All and how it works. And so thank you for sharing uh, your lecture with us uh, in like 15 minutes, Susan. Uh, that was awesome. We really appreciate it. Um, so now we are uh, taking questions. Uh, we will um, uh, provide the slides after, as mentioned, uh, we are recording this webinar and we'll also provide uh, the PowerPoint deck afterwards. So um, I have a few questions before, um, as people start to uh, type in their questions in the Zoom chat, and then uh, we can also open up the lines as well. Um, one of my first questions uh, to both uh, you, Dr. Rogers, and, um, and Stephanie, um, you know, what are you seeing right now um, as it relates to um, your patients and uh, clients and communities and community partners, uh, how is this outbreak uh, really impacting uh, people experiencing poverty and without insurance? Um, I can uh, address that. Uh, well, clearly part of the problem is, is testing. They aren't even really widely available yet, which is a very uh, significant issue here and one that needs to be addressed. But even then, uh, the fact that this administration has gone in with private pharma to create this test, it's going to be outrageously priced and people are not going to be able to afford it. And it's not even clear uh, if insurance companies are gonna pay the whole price that gets charged. So just to have access to something like that has to be crucial and people mm -hmm. need to go get tested if it's available and not be defer deterred because they are worried about the cost. Thank you. Stephanie? Oh, Stephanie, I think you're on mute. Can you unmute for us? Thank you. Someone okay, unmuted thanks. me. Okay. <laughs> um, so we are hearing from clients that um, they are afraid to seek, you know, not just testing and treatment, just always. They often are scared to seek any kind of treatment for anything, thinking that they don't have Medicaid or they don't have insurance, even when they're waiting, you know, even when their application is pending. Um, most people, first of all, they worry about the cost of it. Um, often people feel scared to go into a doctor's office without a card, you know, without saying, I have this. It's, it's not comfortable to walk in and say, I don't have any insurance and I don't mm -hmm. know. Um, what I can do. So people are very reluctant and tend to wait till last minute, um, just even in regular circumstances, to seek coverage and to seek, or sorry, to seek care because they're frightened, um, not just about the bill that could be waiting, but um, for lack of a better term, embarrassed to, to come in and say, I don't have anything. And that's one of the reasons, as Dr. Rogers pointed out, it's so important, not just for everyone to have coverage, but it would be so important for everyone to have the same coverage. Because it would really reduce that stigma of walking in um, with Medicaid or, or with nothing. Um, we also find that when there are co-payments or cost sharing, like Dr. Rogers said, if you think you may have to pay something, even a portion of it, if you're covered, 
and the doctor would ask you for that up front. People feel very scared and, and embarrassed to say, I don't have that money or I don't have anything to give you today at this visit. And so we really want, I know a lot of insurance companies have said that they will not charge cost sharing for the test, but we have not heard from insurance companies saying that they will not charge cost sharing for the treatment. And I think people are very scared about that. And, and President Trump said that in the national um, address, he was uh, wrong. Insurance companies had not said that they would um, get free treatment. So um, there's a lot of confusion on that. The other thing is um, Medicaid has said that for testing and treatment, they will cover it all 100% in Illinois um, for Medicaid recipients and people who are uninsured. Of course, we need more details on that. But nationally, that hasn't yet been the case. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. I really appreciate that. Um, so we have a few questions in our uh, chat box. Um, one of the first is uh, from one of our colleagues. Um, how much is the cost uh, over a 10-year projection of Medicare for all in comparison to the last 10 years collectively of uh, status quo system? Um, what I can say is that it's hard to project uh, specifically what the cost is, but I can tell you that the savings are going to be about 500 billion because of the, the changes in the bureaucracy that would be eliminated. Because you've got a for-profit si driven system here currently, and that's why insurance companies won't agree to forego cost sharing is because that's how they make their money. Um, so that clearly with the elimination of the, um, uh, the cost sharing, the, the prices, you know, the cost will clearly go down. And keep in mind, too, that it's a lot of, as people are healthier, they are more functional. They produce more in society. And so you have more benefit. Um, and the society as a whole is better. Um, but clearly the savings, if you look at now, the whole idea that people are underinsured and uninsured, 40,000 people a year die because of lack of insurance. And knowing that after this um, COVID outbreak, there is going to be a large number of people who were previously employed who will no longer be able to be employed because their business may no longer exist or their employer has gone out of business. So what are they to do? And what if they still have health issues from COVID if they were infected? So it's, it's not a, uh, a profit-driven system isn't morally responsible to something like this. However, if we have a Medicare for all, where we see that everybody benefits, it'll work and it will work cheaper because we've taken the profit away. Yeah. Yeah, and definitely what happens if, you know, they lose their job and they're in a state that has an expanded Medicaid, right? Exactly. Um, exactly. Um, so we have a, a few more questions. Uh, there is a question from uh, one of our grassroots partners, Mothers of Hope, um, and the person says, reviewing the information given, uh, how can we move forward uh, with this information? Uh, what is the result? I'm not sure. So, so I'm thinking the question is uh, most likely one of our uh, next slides uh, that's coming up in regards to how to take action. Um, so I, it would be great to hear from, from you, Susan, as it relates to uh, Medicare for All and then Stephanie um, as it relates to uh, the, the bills and the, um, the advocacy that the Shriver is doing around COVID-19. Well, I think with the presidential uh, campaign coming up, it's important that we uh, stay involved and that we work for Medicare for All. There's a lot of organizations, uh, Physicians for National Health Program is just one of many organizations that promote Medicare for All. And we need to talk to the politicians because this is going to have to be a legislative action that creates this, but I think it'll be a grassroots organization that makes the issue. And already 
there are more people dying here and more people wanting for health care that make a difference in their lives than in other similar countries, uh, industrialized countries. So we have to get involved. We have to pressure our um, politicians and we have to become knowledgeable about this because there's a lot of myths that are out there like you can't afford to pay for it and some studies that show that never looked at the savings you know so and there's myths about how the system would be overwhelmed but that's just a myth the system wasn't overwhelmed and medicare came became enacted and all of a sudden all these older people were allowed to access care it didn't overwhelm when the affordable care act was enacted it didn't overwhelm the system so that's a you know that's a myth that people there won't be waiting times it's been shown that uh so Already we're rationing care the way it is, and we ration it according to how, uh, whether, it, we're rationed on one's ability to pay, not on one's need. And that's the whole problem with this. We need to deliver health care where it's needed. Thank you. Stephanie? Thanks, can you hear me? Thank you, um, Dr. Rogers. I really appreciate what you said in your presentation, and it's absolutely true. Um, in order to get help where it's needed, um, I would suggest that you keep in touch with us. Um, we follow our social media and our posts because we are continually um, putting out there policy recommendations, practice recommendations to our local leaders. But in addition to following us, we need to hear from so, you know, you're out there, you're on the ground, you're talking to um, your constituents in your communities, and that's how we learn what to do and make sure that our advocacy is community driven. So when we hear from you, we really know um, how to direct our advocacy, where to target our efforts. So we wanna hear from you as much as we want you to hear from us. Um, I would also say in addition to the policy work, we do do, especially in the healthcare front and, and our other advocacy areas, individual help. And so if you are a provider out there or you're someone, a consumer or somebody working with a family or a client or a patient, and you can contact us and you can contact me if you need us to get directly involved with a family that's trying to seek coverage or care a provider who needs information about how to um, get their clients or patients covered or any problems with um, uh, the public benefit system, um, we can try to intervene and help on a critical level in the community as well. Thank you, Kina. Thank you. So we have another question in the Zoom group chat. Um, the person says, Dr. Rogers, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, can you talk about the negotiation of prices for services in a single, single payer system? Who sets the price for services now? My understanding is that a single payer system allows one entity, the government, to have a lot of power to negotiate prices down for services. Would this affect compensation for doctors, nurses, and other healthcare workers? If so, should we care? Um, pricing, that's a, it's a complicated issue, but what uh, we propose for Medicare for All is what we call global budgeting, and that a hospital would be given a global budget so that when someone is admitted to the hospital, there isn't a specific bill for that visit so that there's no need to charge $100 for an aspirin tablet. It would be a global budget similar to the way we fund uh, the fire department or police and that there's a global budget. They decide where the fire stations, where the police stations will be, how many firemen or policemen they need for each one. And then that would be how to determine hospital financing. Um, doctors would still be in their own offices or whatever, and they would uh, bill fee for service. And what would happen to doctor salaries is they would not decrease. Um, one of the benefits of the Medicare for All system is that right now, primary care physicians spends over 25% of their time, often more, just on electronic medical records or billing. Now, this is time that would be freed up 
that they could see more patients so that even if they made less money per patient, they would actually make more money because they would be able to see more patients. If you look at the physician salaries in Canada, they are quite equivalent. And there was a time Canadian fish physicians were coming to the US and now that's just the opposite. There's more physicians leaving here going to Canada. There's costs that would be less um, such as um, pharmaceutical costs would be less, it would free up more money there, people could get the drugs that they needed. And that the whole idea that it's a one system, you've eliminated the liaison, which is the private insurance company. And that's how things would get paid. And see, right now we have a system where you have areas of need and then areas of uh, over abundance and right now you have hospitals closing and that's because of their payer mix you have hospitals in uh, poor poverty stricken neighborhoods you have hospitals in rural communities and that's because they don't have enough patients with commercial insurance to sustain them and then you've got areas where you've got three or four hospitals within a mile of each other that have an abundance of money so you have a system now that provides care where it can make money versus care where it is needed. And so it's survival of the fattest, not survival of the fittest. And I think that one of the things that Medicare for All would do would be to change that so that we can provide services where they're needed and not um, just where uh, they can make money. Thank you. Um, I, I have a follow-up question from uh, Stephanie's presentation earlier. Uh, Stephanie, if you could just inform us, uh, currently right now in Illinois, how many um, individuals are uninsured? Um, I know Shriver Center is working with the governor's office to try to cover the uninsured. How many, how many people are we talking about now? Thanks, Kenya. And apologies for any, I'm not sure if my computer is making some background noise here, so trying to fix technical difficulties. Um, the um, uninsured in Illinois, I need to look at what the most recent numbers are, but somewhere around 700 to 800,000. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that is not all low income individuals or individuals who are, have no pass to coverage. Um, some of those people are um, individuals who do have a pass to coverage, could buy health insurance, um, perhaps in the marketplace, but for various reasons have not done so. Um, it could be that they don't know, many people surveyed didn't know that they could get as much cost sharing and help with payments um, as, as they um, could get. There is definitely a rise in the uninsured rate over the last few years due to the sabotage from the Trump administration um, and Congress. The constant uncertainty about whether the Affordable Care Act will be here is really uh, impacting, we think, people um, thinking that it's not here anymore. For instance, we've talked about this a lot, but uh, the first day after the election in 2016, clients were calling us and saying, now that Obamacare is gone, what do I do? They believed the president when he said, the day after I'm elected, it will be gone. Mm -hmm. So the messaging is really important and people um, think that they don't have insurance. There are always people who are eligible for Medicaid and not enroll, especially people who are less connected with the system, who need individual assistance to help them enroll, uh, people who may speak a different language um, and so than English and may have a disability, older adults. So there are people who have a path to coverage who are currently un uninsured and shouldn't be uninsured. There are also populations, in particular documented populations, and some people with, who don't have the immigration status to be eligible for coverage who are uninsured. And that um, is under 200,000, but it's a very significant number. Thank you. No, thank you. I appreciate that, Stephanie. Um, and one of our last questions before we wrap up here, uh, this was a follow up to one of our first questions about the cost of Medicare over 10 year uh, projection. The follow up question is, um, since the change, since to change the system, uh, we need better projections to compare. Uh, how can uh, we convince those in the driver's seat uh, without such comparisons? 
And I'll also allow uh, if, uh, Edward, if you want to follow up and explain your question as well, feel free to unmute. I will say that economists have made projections as to what the, uh, the savings would be and the projected costs. The costs may go up because you will have more people in the system accessing care, but the costs will go down per capita by eliminating the bureaucracy and all the administrative costs in the current system. And you would take away the drive for profit in these systems so that the projections by economists, I can't give you the exact number, but they do project cost savings that are clear. Um, and that uh, there's no question that single payer or Medicare for all would decrease the long-term costs. And there's a lot of ways it'll decrease the cost. It'll decrease the cost of your auto insurance because you wouldn't have to be, have coverage for somebody else's medical bills. It'll decrease mm. my practice insurance because I won't have a multi-million dollar judgment because they have to be able to pay for future medical costs. So there's a big trickle down effect on um, what are costs. Wages would go up because employers wouldn't have to be paying as much for their uh, workers' uh, medical costs. So not only will we have a healthier society at a much cheaper cost, everyone would benefit financially too because of the trickle-down effect of all of these other costs. Thank you, Susan. Um, so we are uh, at time here, and I just would like to reiterate uh, on our PowerPoint deck uh, the take action. Um, and if my colleague could go back to the slide uh, for me um, to thank you. Um, so once again, please share our COVID-19 uh, policy priorities uh, for low-income communities. Please share with your networks uh, on social media. If you are not following the Shriver Center, we are on Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Uh, so please follow us first and then um, also share this information. Uh, with your networks as uh, COVID-19 exposed, uh, people just need to be informed. And so we are finding, we're trying to find as much information as possible um, about this disease and about this outbreak. And there is a lot of information sharing uh, going on at this time. And uh, certainly we want to be a resource for uh, many communities across the nation. So please sign up, please share our information. And once again, uh, to our panelists, thank you today. Uh, Dr. Rogers, thank you, uh, Stephanie Altman, um, for both uh, informing us and enlightening us uh, with uh, your work. Um, and to all of you who attended, uh, thank you for attending. And you can feel free to reach out to them directly. We provided their email addresses if you have follow-up questions. Also, if you would like uh, Dr. Rogers or Stephanie Altman to present uh, to your local non-for-profit, your business, uh, or your foundation, feel free to reach out to them directly. Uh, thank you all for joining us and be well. Bye-bye. Thank you.